A lot of churches, you'd say that in and turn in and turn around and say say hello to somebody. You're like I, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> uh, I'm, I love the fact that you love each other, man. I've missed you guys. It's so good to be home. Really good to be home. I appreciate Dad filling the pulpit last week. I just heard rave reviews as always. I'm so thankful for him and stepping up. And I appreciate Damien and the rest of the staff filling in this week. Tell you what, it's been an interesting few months with just a long season of transition. Uh, living at mom and dad's house for a couple of months, and then we moved, bought a house. And I, when we moved, came back last night, my wife and I were talking, and it's just awesome to come to a home. The transition's over, everything's done, vacation is done. I'm ready to just go. It, it's just so refreshing. Our flight got delayed. We got back about one in the morning which you'd think you'd go straight to bed. I was so wired. I had bills stacked up. And I'm like, no, I'm going to pay some bills. Got to bed about three. Thank God for coffee. Man, it's God's gift to man, isn't it? Had a double portion of that this morning. Be opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, if you will. And as you turn... Um, I think this email got sent out, or you might have seen it on my Facebook page. Pray for Jenny and our little cousin, uh, four years old. His name is Orion. Everybody say Orion. Orion. I want you to get that name so you can pray for him. Uh, he got diagnosed this week with uh, stage four neuroblastoma cancer. It's already metastasized into his bone marrow and his bones. They live in Orlando, and Jenny and I got a chance to just go love on them and show them the love of Jesus and pray with them. Pray for that family. They're broken. They need a miracle and they really need to see who God is. I see things like this and uh, what I see is an opportunity for God to show himself strong. God shows up in moments like that in our lives. We never forget it and we know who he is. I believe this is a moment where God can show himself. It's heartbreaking. Acts chapter 18. Have you ever walked through something in life? I know you have. If you haven't, then get ready because it's coming. Walk through a disillusionment. You know, we all set out with expectations. I know we're not supposed to do that, but we do that with pretty much everything in life. Before we start walking into something, we have this expected, uh, I'll call it an intended outcome. That it will be this way. It will happen this way and everything's going to be great. Maybe you've prepared a huge meal for uh, the 4th of July. Family's coming over and you think, okay, this one will sit here. You've got this place setting. This will happen this way. We'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. You've set out the china and it's just going to be a perfect meal. It's just going to be so great. We're all going to sit around. We're all going to have matching sweaters. No, not sweaters. It's too hot for that. But our family's just going to be perfect. And then you show up and they just start pulling paper plates out and everybody gets in a fight and leaves and it just didn't turn out the way that you expect. I know your family's not like mine at all. It's like that really didn't happen the way that I thought it was going to happen. Every family get together is pretty much like that. Sermons are like that. Think, what's going on in a preacher's head before he preaches a sermon? I can tell you what's going on in his head. First of all, man, I'm, I'm just not worthy to carry this message. And at the same time, you feel this, okay, Lord, you've given me this word. I'm going to speak this word. Lord, I know it's from you. And when it's done, Lord, every person in the church is going to sprint to the altar. With their hands raised, they're going to jump around, shout hallelujah. Their life's going to be radically changed. And then they're going to leave these doors and just upset this world for Jesus. Next week we'll be double the size we were this week. And then the week after that, I mean, we'll have a building project completed within a month. And then you preach a sermon and you can hear crickets chirping in the background. And you say jokes that you think is funny and nobody laughs. 
and then you drive home points that like this is this is it this is going to this is the word of the lord and you look up and there's just new facebook posts all over the place and then you leave completely just what in the world was that all about or maybe you're a worship leader and you have in your mind, God's been speaking to you through this song. You guys know what I'm talking about. And you just there. And it's like, Lord, this is just going to, oh man, it's going to be good. Just a massive explosion of worship is going to take place. The song's just been hitting me so much. God has been ministering to me so much that when we sing this song, cars are going to pull in off the parking lot and not even know why they're coming in. And they're going to come in, it's like, wow, this song is amazing. God is so good. And then you get up to lead a song, and half the people are sitting down. It's like nobody, it just didn't hit them the way that it hits you. And, and you feel, what in the world is it worth? What's it for? Why? And you're just getting so disillusioned. Or maybe you're a Sunday school teacher, and you've been pouring into a class, and you think it's going to go this way, and it's just going to be awesome. Afterwards, you're going to be getting emails all week of telling how great of a teacher you are. This just changed my life. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you so much. And you show up, and just for no reason, nobody came to class that day. And you find yourself at this place of, why did I even do this? What's this even worth? Why should I keep doing this? I just want to quit. You know what they call that word? Disillusionment. When we become illusioned, when we become encaptured in a thought that it's going to be this way and then it's totally something different and we find ourselves dejected and disillusioned. That's really the place that I see Paul in in this story. Two weeks ago on Father's Day, I talked about him going to Corinth at the first of this chapter and he, he has this sermon, you know, he's had a massive experience with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus just a few chapters earlier. God calls him out of his life, he drops his life, his career, his education and everything and he says, okay, I'll follow you, I've been hating you but now I, I'm all in God, I'm going to chase after you with my life, you've given me these words of life I know this is you and then he we've been talking about for months now the experiences that he's had and it never quite ends up the way that he thinks it's going to and in Acts chapter 18 verse 6 this is where we left it they reviled him they hated him they wanted nothing to do with what he was talking about that day and they ran him out of town. Now let me tell you, that, that's, a, that's a sermon that's gone south. That, that's a bad, I guarantee you Paul didn't go into this thinking, okay, this is going to go this way. When I speak, they're going to hate me, they're going to revile me, they're going to call me names, they're going to heckle me. It's going to go this way. I'm asking you, even if you don't like the sermon this morning, don't heckle me, please. And Paul finally just got dejected. And you know what he said? Fine then, your blood be upon your own heads. Let me tell you, nobody ever starts out at the beginning of something thinking, this is going to go south, but I'm going to do it anyway. We all have in our minds these illusions of grandeur. It's going to be this way. And then when it ends up another way, what we do in that moment really defines us as people. This morning, I want to talk about surviving disillusionment. And as I look across this congregation this morning, I'm bold enough to believe that there's some disillusioned people here. That you've started something that you felt like even God told you to do. And it just didn't end up in the way that you thought it was going to. You're hurt. You're depressed, you're discouraged, you're completely disillusioned because it just isn't the way that it was supposed to be. Or maybe you accepted Jesus and you thought, yes, this is it. And then you found out not too long after you accepted Jesus that Satan is still alive as well and he's fighting you. You got black eyes and bloody lips all. 
That's it. Just getting beat up by the end. I, I thought once I followed Christ, that stuff was supposed to be done. And you're disillusioned. Let me tell you, if you haven't hit a moment of disillusionment in your life, you will. And it happens pretty frequently. I, I, I don't believe there's anybody that hasn't been disillusioned at some time. Now this scripture doesn't go out and say, Paul was in just absolute depression. I don't, it doesn't say that. But as we progress through the scripture this morning, I want you to just see what's going on. Paul's been dejected. He's been reviled. Your blood be upon your own heads. And he says, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. In other words, I'm done with you. I know nobody else has ever uttered those words. As you sit here and righteously judge Paul for washing his hands of somebody, you're a Christian, Paul. You're not supposed to do that. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. What's this? Paul wasn't supposed to go to the Jews. He said, I'm done. And then he goes to this Titius Justus. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. All of a sudden, he sees a result. Him with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He knows what you need before you can even formulate the thought that you need this. I'm telling you, he knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought of your heart. Every hurt. Everything just dagger stuck in your back. Every heart's cry. Every dream. He knows that about you. He knows the times that you wanted something and you didn't get it and you've just kind of sit quietly. He knows you that's been sitting here successfully, not letting anyone else around you know what's really going on in your heart. Guess what? You've not been able to fool him. He knows that about you. Those of you that's been wearing a mask, afraid to let your guard down next to your neighbor there because you don't want them to think less of you, let me tell you, God sees through your mask. He knows what's going on in your heart. And this is what's so beautiful about Jesus. He comes to Paul before Paul can even formulate thoughts. And he ministers to him in the place where he is before Paul even realizes he's in that place. All that we know about Paul is he said, I'm done with this. Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm not going to you anymore. I'm going to the Gentiles. And the word of the Lord comes. And he gives five things that I'm going to give you this morning to survive disillusionment. I said Paul doesn't even know it's there, but I believe Jesus knows that Paul needs this word. And when you're in disillusionment, I tell you these five things are of utmost importance. The first thing he says is, do not be afraid. If you're in a place of disillusionment, things didn't turn out the way you thought they were going to, and you're just totally disillusioned. Let me tell you the first tendency that we all go to. We start making decisions out of fear instead of out of faith. I'm going to say that again. When we're disillusioned, the first thing that we let in our hearts is fear. Let me tell you the first time I ever preached a sermon. It was the word of the Lord, so it was good. Homolytically speaking, oh my goodness, it was a train wreck. I was 17 years old. I've told this story many times. Studied, goodness, studied. Sitting under such great men and expositors of the word and preachers like Brother Parrish or Brother David or my dad or anybody. I'm like, man, these giants of the faith. Here I am, a 17-year-old kid that felt called felt called to preach. They accepted the call to ministry. And I go to the Union City Teaching Center and I preach my first sermon. 
knees knocking behind an old wooden pulpit. And I preached for six minutes. And I stumbled my way through that. Let me tell you what I left. Disillusioned. And I started thinking, well, maybe I missed it. Maybe I wasn't supposed to be called to ministry. Well, that was a complete train wreck. I'll never do that again. Some of you can relate to that. You've said that, but well, I'll never do that again. Some people here need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps and stop being afraid of what could be when you know what God's told you to do. See, when we get in those moments of disillusionment, we start letting fear come in. Well, it's, I'm not good enough. I, I, I just can't, I'm scared. I, I, I'm not going to do, let me tell you, Satan knows when to attack. We talk a lot about the timing of God. He's an on-time God. His timing is perfect. Let me tell you, Satan's timing is equally perfect. He knows when to attack you. He knows when to hit you when you're at your weakest. Zach was talking about we're no longer slaves to fear, and that's why it's so important Gary spoke that this morning. None of us are. And when you get to that place where you're disillusioned because life hasn't turned out the way that you thought it should turn out, Fear is trying to creep in to guide your decision-making process. The first word of the Lord is, Paul, don't be afraid. I know you said you're done with these people. I know you're scared because you dropped your life, you dropped your career, what you were trained for, your education, everything. And now, like, what am I going to do now? The first word of the Lord is, don't be afraid over and over and over and over. It's amazing how many times when Jesus shows up into a situation, first thing he says is don't fear or peace. He speaks peace into a situation. Why is that? Because we are such fearful creatures and we let fear come in and captivate us and make our decisions. And in those times of disillusionment, Man, that's when they come the most. If you're going to survive disillusionment and not let that take you to the point of quitting, then the first thing you're going to have to do is stop letting fear guide your decisions and start walking in faith. It's the first thing. Don't be afraid. The second thing he says is this. But go on speaking and do not be silent when disillusionment comes let me tell you the second tendency I quit I quit that's basically what Paul was saying in verse 6 he was saying listen I've spoken the truth to you I quit I'm done with this. Run me out of town, will you? Fine, your blood be upon your own heads. I quit. Let me pause there for a minute. Let me tell you, when results go south, that's not the time to quit. There's a lot of quitters sitting in pews and pulpits across America this morning. Why? Because things didn't turn out the way that we thought they should and I'm mad and I'm done. I tell you, when you're disillusioned, that's going to be your greatest temptation to throw your hands in the air and to just quit. Nobody wants to quit on top when things are going great. It says, don't quit. Jesus gives this word to Paul. Don't be silent. Basically says, keep doing what you're doing. Or as Brother Parrish has so appropriately told us over the years, keep showing up. See, I believe there's people here this morning that's right on the verge of making that decision. I quit. I'm done. Some are ready to quit on God. Some are ready to quit your ministry, your gifting, your calling in your life. Because results didn't turn out the way you thought they should. Can I be honest with you? I get it. 
I understand that. I've written resignation letters. Oh, it must have been the job before this church. No, I'm talking about this job. Talk, no, no, you didn't do that. We're the best church. You are the best church. But I've written resignation letters in the past. Long, long time ago before I learned this lesson. Why? Because things weren't going the way I wanted them to go. Let me tell you, we are not to be results-based as believers. We're to be obedience-driven. I want to say that again. We are to be obedience-driven, not results-based. If you're sitting there waiting and hanging your obedience to the Lord based upon what your results are, let me tell you, you will quit. You'll be done tomorrow, today. But that doesn't have the right to tell me if I'm going to obey the word of the Lord or not. What Jesus is telling Paul is, listen, bro, I've not called you to reach all of Corinth. I've not called you to build a mega church in downtown Corinth. I've not called you to have your name as a street in Corinth because you're so great. I've called you to be obedient to do what I've told you to do. Now keep doing it. Let me tell you, Christian Fellowship Church, the same can be said of you. I don't care if one person shows up to your Sunday school class. If God has called you to teach that class, then you better keep teaching it if nobody shows up. But nobody appreciates it. We don't do what we do for appreciation. We do it for obedience. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't be silent. Keep speaking. Your blood be upon your own heads. I quit. I don't think so, Paul. I've called you to obey. Now go obey. I don't want to quit. What I want to do is cross that ultimate finish line one day and him look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You didn't let the situation dictate what you were going to do. You heard from me and you did it. That's what I want to be said of me. And that's what I want to be said of you. I think you got that point. We'll move right along. The Lord said to Paul, don't be afraid. Don't let fear make your decisions for you. But go on speaking and don't be silent. In other words, keep on doing it. For I am with you. I tell you the awesome thing about Jesus. It's his ever abiding presence. I tell you God has not abandoned you. God has not forsaken you. God has not forgotten you. How can you say that, Richie? You don't know what I'm going through. I might not, but I know what Jesus said. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And lo, I am with you always. There's times that we can simply endure because we know he's there with us. Don't ever take for granted the presence of Jesus. And when Satan comes in to tell you he's forgotten you, that is a lie because his word told you something completely different. David, in the most famous of Psalms, said, I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Jesus tells Paul exactly what he needs to hear. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Keep doing what you're doing because you're not alone, bro. I'm with you. Don't think for a minute in your discouraged, depressed, disillusioned state that you're alone. I'm with you. 
I can walk through some valleys knowing that fact, that Jesus is there. I can walk through some trials knowing that Jesus is there with us. I just don't want to get to a place where I go without him. I want to know where he is, and that's where I want to be. For I'm with you. I'm talking about surviving disillusionment. Are you still with me this morning? First thing he tells them is don't let fear make your decisions. Second thing he says is keep doing what you're doing. You're not going to quit. Third thing he tells him is basically take refuge in the fact that I'm here. Fourth thing he says is this. No one will attack you or harm you. Let me tell you, Paul walked through some junk. Doesn't mean that Paul never had to walk through anything. There's a long list of things Paul endured. Hardships, storms, starvation, stonings, beatings. Shipwreck multiple times. Huh. What's that about then? Paul got a word from the Lord that gave him a motivation to go forward. We're talking about surviving disillusionment. Let me tell you the fourth thing that you need, and I would say it's probably the most important. You need a word from the Lord. And I'll tell you why. Because there's times that that's all we have to go on. That baseline, ugly, dirty obedience, where that's all we have. Lord, I know you said this, so I'm not going to do anything else. He gave him an encouraging word of hope, enough to go forward. In your disillusioned state, what you need more than anything is you need to hear what it is that he's saying. Because there's times that's all you're going to have. And the fifth thing is this. I love how God's view and perspective is so much different than ours. Paul, there he is in Corinth, feeling like that he has just wasted his time. You've called me. This did not turn out like I thought it was going to turn out. And I'm done with this. Your blood be upon your own heads. I quit. I'm out of here. I'm going to the Gentiles. Forget you. I love how God just comes in and says, I have many in this city who are my people. In other words, Paul, you don't even know what you're talking about. You think that you're the only one out there fighting the fight. You think that you're the only one. Boy, we've seen that over and over and over again. You remember Elijah when he went to the cave discouraged from Jezebel because she had made some threats to him and he went running and he finds himself in the backside of a cave and he starts whining and complaining to God. Lord, they've slayed all these prophets and I alone am left. God, I am your sole hope. I'm the only one, God. Nobody understands it but me. You can hear it reverberating, echoing through the cave. His crying and complaining, whining. What does God say to him? Elijah, just stop. There's 7,000 over here that, that they haven't bowed their knee. You don't even have a clue what you're talking about. I can see that same type of thing with Paul here. God's letting him know, listen, you're not alone. There's many people in this city that are my people. What's that about? If you're going to survive disillusionment, and this is the one that hurts the most, you're going to have to learn to lean on that person right next to you. You know, the greatest strength in the life of a Christian is those in this building with us. I'm telling you, I love this church. And I love each and every one of you. Why? Good question. No, thank you. Because I know that I need you. And I know that you need me. 
And the greatest temptation when we're disillusioned is to set ourselves apart and try to be an island. Like Paul Simon said, I'm a rock, I'm an island. I don't need anybody. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Later goes on to say, carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. When Roy and Cheryl go through something, come beside them and lift their arms up. When they're disillusioned, when they're hurting, they need you now more than ever. Well, they didn't ask for it. I'm going to mind my own business. They shouldn't have to ask for it. When I see my brother and sister back here that's had a rough week, the roughest of their life, I tell you, this couple needs you right now. Because they've just, they've walked through a tough week. And it's these moments that we can endure and survive because we have each other. But the enemy does not want us to see that. And that requires you letting your guard down and letting people in. And admitting, I'm broken. I'm completely a mess. Completely disillusioned. I have no clue what I'm even going to do today or tomorrow. I'm empty. That's hard to say because that, that means we have to kill our pride. You know what's especially tough for men? Because we're not in touch with our emotions. It's the truth. We're not. My wife asks me all the time, what are you thinking? Nothing. <laughs> I'm thinking nothing. That's impossible. No, it's not. What do you feel about this? What is a feeling? I have no idea. I'm kidding. We need each other in those moments. Man of God. There's no shame in saying I'm weak. There's no shame in saying I need help. I need somebody. Well, I'm a man. I got this. I can take care of it myself. That's a terrible way to live life. When God's given us the greatest tool and the greatest encouragement in all the world. In each other. But let me tell you, that will come at the cost of letting people know your scars and your weakness. And many will never make that decision to do so. Let me tell you, that means you could get burned. Could mean betrayal. But I'd rather live a life with my sleeves rolled up showing you my scars. Walking hands with you saying, we need each other. And if you burn me, I'm not going to close my heart off. Because I realize I need you. And you need me. And we need each other. Aren't you tired of living life alone? When God's given you this awesome church, well, I've been rejected. Well, reach out again. Because you need that person next to you. And I need you. Talking about surviving disillusionment, Paul had this awesome call. And it didn't turn into a mega church immediately. He got ran out and he said, I quit. Your blood be upon your own heads. And before he could even formulate the thoughts in his mind, Jesus comes to him and says, listen, don't let fear make your decision. Keep doing what you're doing. Take rest because I'm with you. Here's your word of hope for the future. And realize you're not alone here. You got people all around you. I think there's something to that. And I think that word's for us today. Lord, we thank you 
that you're here. Lord, you're here even now. And you're calling to us today. Lord, I can relate to this place. I think we all can. Lord, we've all been in that place where disillusionment has happened. It just didn't turn out the way that I thought it should turn out. It didn't happen the way that you, I thought it was going to happen. And I'm done. I just quit. I can't do this anymore. Lord, I pray for just a renewal of hope, a renewal of strength. And Lord, just a renewal of a decision to obey. And Lord, I pray that you give this church the gift of stepping outside that ugly life of being results driven. And you let us take refuge and comfort in the fact of simple obedience. Lord, it's awesome to just rest in the fact that we did what you told us to do and the rest is in your hands. And tomorrow we're going to get up and we're going to do the same thing because that's what you told me to do. Speak to your people this morning, Lord, and pull them up out of the pit of discouragement and disillusionment, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you never give up on us when we run. Lord, when we start thinking wrong thoughts, Lord, you're still there. Let us see that. And Lord, I pray right now for the gift of not walking in pride, Lord, but just the ability to just bear it all and reveal our hearts in the broken mess that we are. Lord, we're broken and we need you. Who this morning would say, Richie, you've you've been talking to me. And to be honest, this I'm broken. I'm empty. I'm disillusioned. And I feel like I'm by myself. And truthfully, I need somebody, but I don't know how. I see that hand. Where where else? I know you're in this building. I know you're here. I see those hands. Lord, I ask you right now that you just show up in a powerful way. Lord, and you just reveal your heart to us because you know what our heart is before we can even utter it, Lord. Lord, you know our fears. This morning, Lord, we die to the fear-making decision mentality, Lord. We're not going to be making decisions based on fear. We're going to walk in faith, Lord, knowing that you said this, so we plant ourselves right here because you said to do it, Lord, and we're not going anywhere. And I thank you for it, Lord. Renew us, re-energize us, Lord. Give us your strength and give us your power to walk forward. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. He's so good, isn't he? Tonight, I want you to come back. But Richie, it's the 4th of July weekend. Oh, the 4th isn't until tomorrow. Come back tonight. I'm going to be talking on how God can do a lot with a little. Love you guys. You can be dismissed. Worship team, if you want to stay and worship with us, you're welcome. You can dismiss. Love on each other as you leave this morning.